Welcome to Gotta Run With Will. My name is Lance Sven. You may notice that I'm not Will Sanchez, but I'm a guest host today and good friend with Will. And I'm very excited to be hosting today, uh, not just because I enjoy being on this program so much and spending time with Will, but today I get to do a, a very special interview. And if you are involved in New York running uh, at all, um, you're certainly going to recognize the man next to me. So I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Sid Howard. How are you? Lance, I really appreciate that you taking the time to honor me with an a, a interview. I appreciate that. I'm doing great. And you know the most important thing that happened to me this morning? Yeah. God woke me up. I'm not going to ask him for anything else. <laughs> I don't want to be greedy. I want to be <laughs> grateful. Oh, I love that. Yeah. That's very cool. So, uh, Sid, you may not remember this, right. but one of my first interactions with you mm -hmm. was um, I initially ran the New York City Marathon in 2012. The year was canceled, and then we did, like, our own in, in Central Park. Right. But the next, that's right, the Run Anyway Marathon. But um, the next year, I was running it officially, and right. I was very excited about it. And I slept at my brother's house, who lives in Manhattan, because I figured that was the best way, and I'd go catch a bus, and it was going to work out perfect. And I missed the bus. I didn't know where I was right. going or anything. So the, my first experience was with you was I flagged down a bus that said Team for Kids. Oh, that's And nice. I went up to you, and I saw you for the first time, and right. I recognized you, but I wasn't exactly sure. And I was like, I'm trying to get to Staten Island with the runners. Can I come on your bus? And, and you welcomed me on right away. And, you, and then you told my story to the whole bus. Yeah, right. But you know, because actually the bus was mainly for Team for Kids. Yeah. But the fact that you came in, how could I say no to <laughs> someone who's going to be part of the, the New York City Marathon? That's right. Well, thank you very much yeah. for letting me on that bus right. that day. That <laughs> meant a lot. Sid, I want to start with, um, you have a, a long history of running and a lot of races and even records and all of that. Right. But I would say most people know you from your involvement with Team for Kids. Right. So could you tell us a little bit about when you got started with them, how you got started, and what you're doing even today with the organization? Okay. In 2007, my, my, my second wife, Esteri, and I, we, we both w went to Albany and we got certified as a level one uh, coach, you know, with the USATF. We came back and one of my teammates, his name is Frank Handelman, he said, Sid, I got an open for you and Esteri for coaching for the team for kids. This is 2007, Lance. And I, I said, what? You know, I'm just getting involved with, but I was running anyway, even without the certification, just based upon my coach who coached me from the beginning, when I joined Central Park Track Club, his name was George Wisniewski, I learned so much from him. Hmm. Even without the certification, which made it that I was certified, I had a lot of experience based with my original coach. Now what we do is we, we, it's three days. We have it's almost the same thing it was in 2007. We have a long run, conversational pace on Saturday. We have hills or interval workouts on Wednesdays. And Monday is like strength work. Or, or now we do it on uh, in internet. We do it with Zoom. Oh, okay. It used to be in person that we did uh, the strength work, the stretching, the whole thing. That's what we, that's what basically what I do now. Okay, and then you're training to be marathoners. We training people who've never run a race, much less a five k. <laughs> then we have five months from June to November to get them from Central Park to the Verrazano Bridge and come back and get that medal. And <laughs> get that medal. Right. And I started running in 1978, and this is what happened. My, I used to, I had this little paper route that I did for the kids just to give them something to do. Mm -hmm. They hated it. They told me <laughs> later because they had to get up at 5 o'clock and, and deliver the, the, the Star Ledger, the New York Star Ledger. So I used, and after the Saturdays, we'd get something to eat and then maybe we'd go for a little back and forth run. And then they got, I got interested in it. I used to take them on a five mile run and give them a dollar for each mile. So what, what <laughs> happened, my son said, hey dad, there's a race for old men at the high school. And well, let me clarify, for old men, yeah. you weren't exactly old at the time. I was older than, I was 39. You were 39 years old. That's old men compared to your compared children. Compared to the kids, right. Yeah. So, but that was gonna be your first time racing 
since how old were you when you stopped? 17, so it was 22 years. So 22 years, and right. you said that was almost like a different life now, right? It, right. It, so, I, so you, you started uh, almost training with your children by accident. By accident. By accident, and then your son said they have this race for the old oh, men, at the and then school. what happened there? And what happened, my, I have a neighbor who's, he was a friend of my oldest son, and he says, Mr. Howard, I would go train with you. Guess what, Lance? I didn't know anything about training. This is in Plainfield, New Jersey, mm -hmm. Hubstein Field. And they had a, a groundkeeper, which he was, he wouldn't, nobody could violate his rules. <laughs> Big Frank. And, and, Big Frank. And he saw us <laughs> crawling under the fence. He said, come on in. <laughs> and and what, what, what took place that with my uh, neighbor, we ran three weeks of 400s. I didn't know nothing about anything else. <laughs> And I ran the first race, uh, Lance, I, I ran 505 miles. I didn't even know they had races for men out of high school. I didn't know That's nothing right. about that. And a 505 mile at any age is right. flying. Right. That's, that's really impressive. And you did that on, what was it, three, three? Three weeks. Three weeks of training. And then you said, all right, that's enough for me. I'm going to pack up my running shoes and I'm done. No. Or did you do something else? No, because... When I got there, they said, Sid, do you know they got races for our age group, this, that? And I was, you know, I had a, a messenger service in New York City at that time and not had no idea that, and, and that I, and they said, you know, we could do the marathon, you could do 10Ks and whatever. And I went to the New York Roadrunners and I joined the New York Roadrunners in 1978, 44 years ago, to be exact. And we had this guy, we used to meet on Wednesdays at the, the New York Roadrunners was on 63rd Street Y between Central Park West and Broadway mm. or, or Columbus Avenue. And we used to go out on Wednesday night, we'd go out and run two lower loops and go to, go straight to 72nd to the Riverside <laughs> uh, Drive and run up to the George Washington Bridge and back. But Everybody was racing each other. We had no idea what we were doing. That's, that's funny. None. So for, you, you talk about these races for old men. Right. Um, and there's something called masters. Right. Right. For, could you explain a little bit about what that means? Because most people's, their running career stops after maybe college. Right. But you, right. there's actually competitive running afterwards, which right. is what you've done and become pretty good at. Right. So can you explain a little bit about masters? Well, when I started running for masters, the magic number was 40. And actually, from 30 to 39, you had to race against people almost 10 years younger than you. Oof. So when you got to be 40, oh, you now, <laughs> now. And then they changed it from 10-year age group to a 5-year age group. So at that time, Lance, nobody wanted to have nothing behind their, ne their, their first number but a zero or a five. That means you're in a new age group. That's right. Okay. So that inspired a lot of us guys. But that was... Very, that's what helped a lot of people who came out of high school, yeah. never went to college or went to college and stopped. Now they got, we have another career. Yeah, because there's so many of us that once we finish college sports, or you still have that competitiveness and you want to get out. Right. So this is something you can actually join. And this is through New York Roadrunners and they, it's through they have York. other ones as well. Yeah, they have, in New York Roadrunners, they have the age group. But then you find out that they have, age group races for the national race for throughout the country. They have races for men and different in our age groups and all over. They, they pick a different state, city, or where they're going to have the national championships. That's and very boy, cool. so you get, and you've been to multiple cities, multiple states, even countries. Yeah, countries. Yeah, yeah I've been five, five continents. I five ran. continents. Five continents, including the, the continent that my ancestors came from, Africa. I was at South Africa. Wow. I went to Australia and Hawaii and then all the Europeans. And I, it, Lance, when I say that God gave me what I needed, I had no idea at that time that I was being blessed. I was, I'm blessed to be sitting here with talking to you now. Mm. And who would ever thought, I mean, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I wouldn't even think that I even had a career. And I loved it so much. I didn't care if I finished first, second, or third. I'm just like any other runner. And to be a runner, you cannot have common sense. <laughs> no runner, 
it, you either you either got to be a runner or have common sense. You cannot possess both <laughs> at the same time, because there is nobody. Li- I'm part of that fraternity, and I love it. There is nobody would do what we do. Right. Run in the cold. <laughs> run in the heat. Run when it's snow. Run. Right. Run when it rain. Even run when we injured, and yeah. we know we shouldn't do it. But I'm happy. To, I'm happy to be a, one of those people who did right. everything that I just said. <laughs> the only thing we don't run is ice and lightning. That's, right. That's the only thing that stops us. Other than that, we out there. You got to run anyway. Yes. So you're very gracious when you say you're just like any other runner. Mm-hmm. But Sid, you're, you're not exactly like every other runner. Mm-hmm. You are running into ages that other people haven't run before. They say it's time to end. But right. you actually have held some records that... Uh, in in the masters category, right? Can you right. tell me about the first time you broke uh, a record? The first time I, we broke a record, I was in the fifties, and um, with the Central Park Track Club, we broke the the record of it's called a sprint medley. Other words, we have one guy, we have two guys. They run the the two. It's the two hundred, the four hundred, the eight hundred, and and uh, three quarters of a mile. So I ran. I was the anchor with the with the um, with the with with the 800 meters. So we broke the record. We set that world record with a 358. The record didn't even last longer than maybe two months. <laughs> it's really. And then, uh, but you broke it. We broke that, that record. That was my first yeah. record. But my first individual record that I set was when I was 60 years old. I ran two thirty uh, two twelve for outdoor, which lasted for 13 years. That was outdoor, but, my, but my, that was American record. This was uh, 800 meters. Right. But the world record I set when I was 60 was 214.75 at the New York City Armory. Wow. And, and, the, and with the zero at the end of zero, your, that's the time that's to right. break it, right? You need a zero after the, <laughs> the first number or a five. Now, the New York uh, Armory is a fantastic uh, venue, and. I, I love how the, the, the corners are like yeah, smoked right. up. You feel yeah. like you're like leaning into right, it. Right, right. And all. Uh, but that was a really special record that you broke. Right? It was because very who special. Because who was in the stands for you that day? My, my son, he never told me, Sid Jr. I didn't even know he knew I was going to run that night. <laughs> I'm look up after the race. He comes with my grandkids and my daughter. Seeing him was more, even more special than the record, but as much as I enjoy that record. That's cool. He, for him to surprise me like that. Yeah, because it's showing that family support. Oh, yes. Sid, a... You're a very lucky, I'll say lucky man. Yeah. Um, but God's been very good to you. You have six children. Yes. Uh, 19 grandchildren. Yeah. And... and as of now, you have 19 great grandchildren. As of now. 19. As of now, that's as what I'm of saying. Now. Yeah, that right. is, that's quite, quite a legacy. Right. And, as I said before, this is a blessing. I have no idea. My, my, my father and, and, and mother, I, they had more than I had in, in mm. terms of grandkids and great grandkids. But now it's getting less. Yeah. My children and my grandkids, they're not having ch- kids like we have. No, that's not happening no more. So you were one of... I was number seven of ten. You were number seven of ten. Seven of and ten. And I noticed that I think all of your siblings had nicknames. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, what Did you have a nickname? I never up? had a nickname or a middle name. Oh, not even a Only name. some of our siblings had a middle name. Okay. But my, my, the, my, the oldest, my oldest brother... His name was Anderson, but they called him Spike. I like that one, yeah. And my <laughs> second oldest, they called him Harold. He, they didn't call him. That was his name, is Harold. But they called him Dirty Red. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Thing. Dirty Red. And Dirty you, Red. And back in those days, <laughs> a lot of young black people, boys, they conked their hair, you know, to make it nice and smooth and everything. Yeah. And he got... It, it, he. It, it, it stayed there so long, his hair turned red, and he had to put his head in the toilet because it was murdered. That's how they called him Dirty Red. That's how he got it. And the one after me, they called Ronald. His name is Baldy. He's the number eight. Then Lucille, which is number nine. Did did Baldy actually lose his hair or just? No, Baldy. No, my father just gave him nicknames. Hey, Baldy, <laughs> this one is Muggsy and the Mugsy. Spike. And he, Muggsy his, is the baby of the family. Muggsy right? is the baby. Okay. His name was uh, Leroy. So, so Anderson, your your oldest brother, was named after your grandfather. Yes, correct? he was named after my grandfather. And you guys were your your grandparents and your parents were both from Georgia. 
Right. Macon, Macon, Georgia, Macon, Georgia. To be, yes. So I, yeah. I enjoy when you talk about how um, the week was normal, you, you eat whatever, but Sunday was all Southern food, right? What you normally eat uh, at, in the afternoon, like collard greens and sweet potatoes, uh, sweet potatoes and potato salad, you have it in the morning and then you go to church. <laughs> Adventure, okay. I love church, but the most important thing I loved about church was the choir. Mm. They could sing. I mean, I, the Reverend was saying, he was saying a lot of things. He was talking, he probably was giving me good information, right. but it wasn't <laughs> penetrating. I just wanted to hear the song. Yeah. So, yeah, that, when I heard the song, I thought we were almost ready to go. And I was, <laughs> that's what it, but I, that, that was really part of my life. And I, I, I really, my, my mother and father did everything they could to make us. Mm. to give us the, the information that we needed. Even though they, we, we didn't come from a very uh, background that was, we had a lot of material things, but I like that part. You know why, Lance? Because in my generation, we created everything. Yeah. The kids now, they entitled. My, my <laughs> grandkids, they never leave the house. When we were young, when I was young, Sydney, get in the house. Don't you know it's raining out there? No, we Didn't just happen. wanted to be out there. Yeah. But we, we created every game you could think about. Ring of Levio, Johnny Ride the Pony, Hide and Seek. We had marbles. We had the kites. We had the yo-yos. We played pickup sticks, jacks. We, we, we did all these games because we didn't have no television. Mm. And all we had was the radio. So if you have the radio, it was like, you had to listen to the fat man, and he steps on the scale and he weighs whatever. So you had to imagine this. The kids now can't imagine because right. they see everything. It's given to they don't have that information that I have back in those days. That's what I think, Lance. All of this stuff helped me be part of what that book is saying. Yeah, well, it's a good time to to mention the book. You know, we're talking here, and and the way that I seem. Like, I know so much. I feel like I know you said so mm -hmm. well because I just read through your book. Right. And it's a fantastic book. It, the title is God Gave Me, but the subtitle is God Gave Me What I Needed, Not What I Wanted. Right. So in the book, you're, you talk about the way that you grew up. And you grew up in New Jersey. I'm a Jersey boy myself. Okay. I'm from Ocean County. Uh -huh. So where you grew up in Elizabeth, in a, Elizabeth Port, right? Elizabeth Port is either, could, depending on how you look at it, it's the last street in Elizabeth or the first street. That's right. Yeah, depending either, where you're coming. Either way you look at it, but a mile away is Staten Island. Okay, yeah. One mile away, and my, not me, but my brothers and some of his friends used to swim across there and come back. I, I'm a pretty good, I just could survive. I ain't, <laughs> right, going, yeah. I ain't going out there and do none of that <laughs> stuff, but that yeah. was a great, that, that was a great it was come a, up. Yeah. It was a good neighborhood. And you, you described in the neighborhood how there was all, it was like a, a, a mixed neighborhood, so there was all races, all, all religions and, and genders, of course. And you said that the, the parents would actually look out for everybody. No. So, so it, like, like your neighbor's parents and stuff, they were all kind of looking out for all the kids. That must have been a cool kind of place to grow up. I, I remember Hillary Clinton saying in one of her books, it takes a village to mm. raise a child. It, we didn't, ha I didn't know anything about that at that time, but you had to be on your P's and Q's. <laughs> if you do something wrong and one of your neighbors, boy, what you doing? That's what they would say. <laughs> oh, please, Mr. So-and-so, please don't. You know, I'm gonna do it again. Don't tell my father, my mom, but that's what the neighborhood, and the neighborhood put, consisted of, we had blacks, we had people from uh, Poland, mm -hmm. we had a, a couple Jewish people, and we didn't know anything about, I never heard that word, the N word ever used to me because all mm. my friends, that was, they, they were named was the Lip Keys. And they always come to the window, hey, Sydney, you wanna come out and play? That's all we wanted to play was handball, yeah. stickball. Just be and out together. We ate at, they, I ate at their, their, their kitchen, sat right there in their kitchen. Their father played horseshoes with my father. Mm. And this is the neighborhood. Is, this is how it was, yeah. but eventually everything goes yeah. as you grow up, you learn different things, and you be, you, you know, ideas of what you had when you were younger have changed because based upon your friends, 
and even your family. Well, so I'm just so happy that I had the friendship that I had with them when I was younger, and it helped me look at people as a whole. Yeah. I don't want to look at people that you this and I'm that. No, I'm I'm happy that God let me evolve to be the way I am. Yeah, and you 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 tell a story which was um, uh, almost a little shocking of your first trip. You you're from New Jersey, and uh, but your first trip where you went to Texas. Right. And we'll get to this, but you were it was after the Air Force. No, or, I was in the Air Force. You were in the Air Force at the time. Right. Um, but can you just describe a little bit about your first trip to Texas, riding on the bus? Here we go. I mean, riding on the bus is mainly coming from Newark, Penn Station, to Clovis, New Mexico. That was the difference. But here I am, a 17-year-old boy. I don't care. I, people might say, you know, you're a man if you join the Air Force. Chronologically, Lance, I was, I was uh, old enough to join the Air Force, 17. Maturity-wise, I wasn't mature at mm. all. But you guess what? I was able to get around. But the, the most important thing about that Texas thing, when we were 17 and we had, we only uh, got friends with people from the north, east, like from Philadelphia, New York. All of us guys had something in common because we was born in that, that area. Could you imagine 17 year old boy, me, going to El Paso, Texas, and across the line, it says, war is old Mexico. It don't say old Mexico, Mexico. <laughs> right, yeah. And could you imagine this little boy in 17? <laughs> and you go in, and then you could go into a bar. <laughs> and you go in the bar, give me, you know, like those uh, movies, uh, gun smoke and all, give me uh, tequila or whatever. I yeah. Know, nothing about that. And then you got these ladies in the bar. So, I didn't know anything about that until, but that's another story. I can't, that's right. I can't say too much about that, but you could use your imagination. Yep, and it, okay. stories like that are in the book. Which yeah. Is great. yeah. <laughs> if, so, if anybody want to know what happened, they have to buy the book. That's right. There you go. <laughs> um, with, yeah, the stories of why when you're in, in Mexico sounds like they were, they were fun and you were with your friends and experiencing life, which is a very fun. But um, when you were on the actual bus, right. when, once you got to the Mason-Dixon line, Right. Can you talk about that? Because th this is a story that most people my age and, and younger, certainly we, we can't relate to. Oh, no, you all. can't relate to that. In 1956, after my father reluct reluctantly signed me, he didn't want to sign me, he said, you wait until you 18, which would have been February. This is October. He signed me in. So, and basic training is three months. Mm. So after the three months, which was December, I come home, I get a, I get a ride. You could get a flight. If you're in the Air Force, if they got any planes going that way, you, for nothing. Oh, nice. I spent all my money to come back, and I had to get the bus. I, I got on the bus, Newark Penn Station, not New York Penn Station, Newark Penn Station. I get on the bus with my nice USA uniform <laughs> on. When I get to the Makes and Dixon line, the bus driver, he didn't say, hey, mister, or young man, or airman. He said, hey, boy, get in the back. And that was my first experience with, with segregation. Even though I came up in a town, Elizabeth, New Jersey, where they had, uh, they had I, 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 was, I, I was born next to the projects. They had four courts. Three was for white, one for colored. But I, didn't, I, I couldn't think in terms of why, they, they, why it's like that. I thought it was always like that. I didn't, I didn't think in terms of we being segregated or anything. So I didn't look at it like that, but that my first experience when I got to the Major Dix, Dix, Dixon line and I had to go to the back, then from two, two days of riding from, uh, from North to Clovis, New Mexico, that you couldn't go in the, in the restaurant, had, you had to go in the back, you could go in the restaurant, only the order, you, they had a window. But even at that, I never, I never even looked at it like, why me? Hmm. How come this country is, nope, I didn't do that. And that's so interesting. You are, you're wearing your Air Force uniform. Right. You've taken an oath saying that you'll, you'll die for this, right. this country. You'll die for those people right. who are actually being racist towards you. Right. And they're still saying, 
you know, go to the back or you can't I, use And I didn't even look at it like, I didn't think in terms of, yeah. I thought this was, oh, okay, this is the way it is, you know. I, I didn't look at it as why he called me a boy and stuff like that. And I just, I'm so used to taking orders because <laughs> I needed that discipline from not paying attention in school when I failed woodshop. <laughs> I was the class clown making everybody laugh. But, yeah. the, but the joke was on me because mm. the, I'm glad that teacher did that because I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you now. If I would have passed that, my life, I have no regrets, Lance, about mm. what happened. I am, whatever happened to me, it was a total blessing. Yeah. Well, you're, you're talking about no regrets, and you said it really quick about woodshop. Right. Right, you, you were a fine student, except for two classes, right? right. Mathematics and then woodshop. Right. And in the book, you even said, who fails woodshop? Nobody, <laughs> nobody fails. I mean, all the, they can't make you use a jigsaw. All you right. have to do is just keep your mouth shut and listen to the teacher. And, mm -hmm. and the teacher would say, well, try it this way, try it that way. Yeah. But no, and I couldn't do that. You wrote in the book about when you didn't understand something in your mathematics class that right. what you, you were not quick to raise your hand. And right. that kind of set the tone for your schooling. What was that like? Well, it was like that because as a little young boy, you don't want your friends in that school when you raise your hand and ask a question that everybody knows except you. So they, you didn't want nobody to laugh at you. Mm. And you know, that as you grow up, you find out the only question that, that is bad is the one that's not asked. Mm. And, but that's how I, I, and, but guess what, Lance? I became a Dodger fan at the age of eight, mm -hmm. 1947, April the 15th, Jackie Roberts. My father didn't uh, like any ball plays. He didn't like baseball until that Jackie Robinson. That's right. And and you guess what? I became a statistician. I, yeah, you and you, you did that to create time with your dad too, because sometimes when your dad would talk to his friends, they would have baseball discussions or arguments, right. and he would pull you in and say, "What was that stat with Jackie right. Robinson or right. Pee Reese or someone?" Yeah. When you eight or nine or six or five or whatever. You don't have nothing up here, so you got plenty <laughs> of information to put up here. Now, as you get older, it takes a little longer when you, somebody asks you a question to process. It's not a senior moment. It's just like it takes longer to process. <laughs> but when, when I couldn't do, when they took a piece of pie in maybe the third grade, and they cut it in four pieces, and they say, say the, uh, they didn't say it to me, but they say it to the whole class, if I take one piece away, what is left and what did I take? Instead of me saying one fourth or three quarters left, yeah. I didn't know. But guess what? If Jackie Robinson got up at four times and he got one hit, he was batting 250. And that, which was, that was something that just clicked. Could you imagine that? But I couldn't put it together. If the mm. teacher would have had something to put that together with me, I wouldn't be sitting here. So I'm glad the teacher couldn't yeah. do that because <laughs> my life, I love the fact that I lived the life I did. Yeah. I don't have no regrets for what happened. Yeah. And I'm happy that I could be able to, to speak on about maybe it could be a beneficial to somebody else. Yeah, and I have two teenage boys and I want them to read it too because you mm -hmm. have a lot of good life lessons in there. Right. And the one is about when you said you didn't know what to do, you didn't raise your hand, instead you just kept quiet. Right. And that seems like that's something that a lot of kids do right. these days where they'll just, instead of asking for help, Right. Um, they'll just keep it quiet. And that's not just school. It's also like for mental health or things that's going on in their lives. And I think you're, you're a really good example of being able to admit, hey, I don't, I don't know. Because right. even when you started running the marathon, I love how you wrote, you said, I didn't know anything about marathon. Nothing. I didn't know nothing. I didn't so even... what'd you do? You got a coach. You it... started asking questions. Right. But before that, Lance, the first marathon I ran, I didn't eat because I thought the lighter you are, <laughs> The better, and, and then the old timers say, hey, Sid. Have a sandwich uh, before yeah, you run. <laughs> and not only that, guess what they said? They said, Sid, don't go for time. I said, I'm going to break three hours. Mm. They said, enjoy it. I said, oh, no, I'm going to break three hours. And, and, and when I got, at that time, when you came into uh, Central Park, it was uh, on 20, uh, 103rd Street, which is a little hill. And I told I, I was running a seven minute pace then. I had to run three miles, I could have broke it. I had 54 minutes to run three miles. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do it. 
I was walking like a <laughs> skeleton. It's and difficult. people was holding out oranges or for their family. I snatched the orange and drink and kill it. I was starving to death. <laughs> this, is, this is so important because yeah. a lot of people now, I always tell them, this is what I tell the runners that I'm coaching, don't think about competing. Think right. about completing. Oh, there you go. And because you're going to get the same medal that the first guy got. That's right. You know, so that's, and, and, it, and if you woke up that morning with the expectations mm. to achieve, what, to finish, you did. You achieved your goals. So what more could you ask for? That, yeah. That's what I think about that. Well, that's very good. That's great <laughs> advice for, for a runner. Um, mm. And it's exciting that you're a coach now right. where you can speak that into these other <laughs> new runners. Like, hey, right. grab the orange. Right. Or <laughs> eat a little bit before or something like that. Yeah. So how many marathons have you completed? I completed nine out of nine. Nice. And when I ran my first marathon, it wasn't even... One day later, I said, I would never run that again. Hmm. And then another day, I, I, I ran I ran my first mile, marathon with three months training. The second marathon, I said, I'll never do it. I ran it again, the next one. So I ran in New York and New Jersey in, in four months. So and you ran in New York City, and I, I believe it was, what, uh, 302? 302. And then you decided, I'm going to beat it yeah. next month. And you ran in New Jersey. What would you finish? 303. 303, yeah. Unbelievable. <laughs> I didn't learn. You know? right. they, they tried to tell me, but no, they said, take it easy. Enjoy your run. Yeah. I said, oh, no, I'm going to break that three hours. That's and I fantastic. Do it. So Sid, you have a whole lot of stuff. We can't even cover your whole, your whole life um, in this talk. Right. Um, but you, you ran a successful uh, delivery business for a long time. And I love the name, the name of the business. Super Fast Deliveries. Super Fast Deliveries. <laughs> I think that's fantastic. Um, and you, you were there for a long time. And then um, you, had, uh, you actually made that into your own business. And right. you got to meet uh, at least one of your heroes. Yeah, Who that? Muhammad Ali. That's, yep. That's Muhammad Ali, I... I actually, you know, because my business, I became one of the, the messenger service for Random House. So as a messenger service for Random House, you deliver these books to all the media, WPIX, NBC, CBS. Mm. You deliver it to a bookstore. Just all you want them to do is read it so they could critique it and maybe give you a, some, a good, uh, give them yeah. a, a good feedback on, hey, this is a good book and they should read it. But that was, I couldn't, I couldn't even imagine. I got this opportunity to run and I'm going to be in Random House. I used to park the car on one block and run four different avenues. And, and I think that was helping before I even started running. Didn't even have no idea. Wow. So yeah. all that probably built you up. That though. built me up. That's very cool. That built me up. That yeah. was that was part of my coming into running again as a falling in love with running again. I couldn't believe it. Very cool. So the book is, of course, God gave me what I needed, not what I wanted. Right. So could you just spend uh, the last couple minutes talking about what really does that mean? Because you've lived what I would say is a, a fantastic life and right. a lot of great experiences and uh, family to show for it. Right. Uh, medals, world mm -hmm. record. Right. Um, but what, when you say, God gave me what I needed, not right. what I wanted. Well, number one, I got married when I was 18. I wasn't planning on getting married. But the person that I, I which, which was one I thought that I may have married, I didn't. And the one I did marry was the perfect person for me. Mm. So when I said God gave me what I needed, even though my mind wasn't on that person, uh, her name is Sandra, mm. and she was only 16 years old. So back in those days, I don't have to tell nobody. If you marry somebody at 16, the, the father went into his closet and got his shotgun. <laughs> so we called this shotgun wedding. That's right. But that was the best thing. Mm. That's what I mean when I says that he gave me what I needed. He, he gave me the wife that made it possible for me to have my children. Yeah. And the person that I liked, they, she had five children, and, it, and they all became friends, my kids. And I'm friends with her husband yeah. as well. Oh, so, I mean, this is, what more could you even ask for? But I could have never be what I was without God's intervention and his blessings. And you even said when you were talking about Sandra, how 
she waited for you to mature. She did. And, th- and thank God for that because right. she matured before before you did. You got to remember, Lance, girls and women mature before the men. <laughs> I couldn't say that before because, you know, men had macho. You ain't gonna, right. How could a girl be smarter than a boy? No way. How <laughs> could a, a woman be smarter than the men? No, that's not happening. That's right. But when I learned, when I was able to accept that, I became a man. Mm. That's and I, I love how you wrote about her and you said that she actually made you feel better about you. Right, but without Sandra, I could not be what she did for me mm. because when I say she waited, I was doing a lot. I was on taking opioids, all kind of stupid stuff that I was doing. Yep. And she sat back there and said, I, I'm, I'm going to wait for him. You know, I, because see, a, a boys and men think they could say something and they made that girl like them or made that woman. No. When a girl see a boy, she sees something that she wants. The boy don't have to say a word. Hmm. But the boy thinks, I got one. I can get another one now. That's, that's, right. that's, that's, that's how that works. <laughs> but if you get the right one, and she said, I'm going to wait until this boy becomes a man. And that's what my wife did for me. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Well, Sid, you have a lot of wisdom to you. Uh, mm-hmm. Reading your book, um, there's a lot of wisdom in this book, and I, I say that I, I read it very quickly. Mm-hmm. And not because of the brevity of it, but because it, it was very, very good. I felt like we were having a conversation right. just like we're, we're doing now. Right. So I want to thank you for writing this book. For anyone that's interested, you can uh, purchase the book, uh, God Gave Me What I Needed, Not What I Wanted, by Sid Howard, of course. And thank you so much for this time. And I want to close with saying that um, in, one of the stories that you have is when you went to Mexico and you actually spent your whole paycheck. And uh, it was a, a fun partying weekend. But you said, afterwards, I was broke, but I had, I had life experience. Right. And right. how cool it is that you have a life that is just so filled with experience and just so well lived. And, and, and it's, none of this could have happened, Lance, without God's blessing. Mm-hmm. None of this. And mm-hmm. I really appreciate you taking the time to give me this opportunity to say something about my life and about the book. Yeah, as a, a pastor myself, mm-hmm. um, I think God is looking down at you saying that he's very proud of you. Th- thank you and, so uh, much. Thank, thank you for you. all that, that you're doing for the running community yeah. uh, in New York in general, Sid. So, so thank you very much for, for being here. I really appreciate that. Thank you, my brother. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for joining us with Gotta Run with Will. Again, my name is Lance sitting in for, for my friend, Will Sanchez, and we will see you next time. Yeah. Gotta run.